Welcome to today's CPD webinar on overcoming the challenges of connecting precast to precast and precast to in-situ. My name is Sally Stacey, I'm a specification engineer for Invisible Connections here in the UK. And I'm Stephen Ford, I'm the technical manager for Invisible Connections. And we'll shortly be presenting a PowerPoint presentation. Um, now, with regards to Invisible Connections, uh, we're based in Tame in Oxfordshire, um, where we manufacture continuity strip um, and also partner with Invisible Connections in Norway in supplying telescopic connectors. Uh, we supply to UK markets, Norway supply uh, around the world. And we've been going for seven years, but uh, invis uh, Invisible Connections in Norway have been going for 30 years. So although the technology is relatively new in the UK, it's been widely used for many years in Scandinavia and also on mainland Europe. So could you share our screen now, Steve, um, yeah. for the presentation? So as I mentioned, the presentation's on overcoming the challenges of connecting precast to precast and precast to in situ concrete. And there are a number of challenges. Um, firstly, structural performance. Uh, you know, it's important, most important that the structure stays up. Um, then there's the environmental impact of whatever we're designing, uh, what opportunities are there for value engineering, because the client has a budget and also a time scale, um, and also fulfilling our CDM obligations, because we don't want to design something that introduces avoidable risk to the workers on site. Now, it may be tempting to look at each of these things in isolation. However, it could be that, for example, we develop a design for providing for robustness um, or for a sort of tying forces, that uses excessive resources or it's impractical to build. Um, or we could have a solution for fire resistance that requires potentially hazardous intumescent paints. Or the design could be over-engineered and therefore prohibitively expensive. So, uh, but we, don't def we definitely don't want it to be so lean that it fails structurally or isn't adequately fire protected. So ideally, um, we need to consider all of these factors simultaneously. Our aim with this presentation is to illustrate how using telescopic connectors enables structural engineers to produce a cost-effective design uh, that gives the required structural performance uh, while minimising environmental impact and creating a safer working environment for the people on site. And we want to be able to do that simultaneously and in a simple and straightforward way. We're also going to show, hopefully, how you can go from this detail on the left-hand side where we've got a precast concrete landing sitting on a clearly visible steel angle, uh, which the architect's almost certainly going to want to hide, to the detail on the right-hand side, where we have a completely invisible means of support to that precast concrete landing. Or if we're designing with a precast concrete frame, we can go from the detail on the left-hand side here, where we've got a column with big bulky corbels, which are difficult to design, difficult to form for the precaster, um, and that column is going to be difficult to transport to site to the column on the right hand side incorporating telescopic connectors where we've got a nice neat simple column now um, before we start uh, progressing with the presentation just in case you're not familiar with telescopic connectors um, i'm just going to briefly introduce them and then i'll show you a two minute video so on the top left, we've got our TSS connectors. These are predominantly used for supporting precast landings that have a fair faced concrete finish, uh, both to the top and the underside. So these are used where you haven't got any screed or any floor covering on the top of the landing. Below those, we've got RVK connectors, uh, which are again, predominantly used for landings. These have been used for other things, walkways, power pits, but generally they're used for landings. But with the RVK, there's a screed or a floor covering of some sort on top of the landing. Next to those, we've got our BSF connectors, which are for supporting heavier loads, usually a beam, uh, a precast beam to another beam or a precast beam to a column. And then, as I mentioned, we also manufacture a continuity strip, and that's our Furbox um, CARES approved bespoke uh, reinforcement continuity system, but that's not a telescopic connector. So we're not going to be talking about those today. We're going to be talking about telescopic connectors. And as you can see, we've got a, a complete range and we in, in team offer uh, technical and practical engineering support to designers and also uh, the uh, contractors. Now, we've got over 300 attendees today, which is fantastic. Um, and many of you are watching from overseas. Most of what we say will be applicable worldwide, 
Um, but there is legislation and regulations that we refer to, and they are specific to the UK. Okay. So we're going to have a video now for two minutes. This illustrates how the connectors work and will inform everything that follows. So these are our TSS connectors. They're a high grade rolled hollow section that sits within another rolled hollow section and they slide in and out, hence the, uh, the telescopic name. They're cast into the landing by the precaster. Recess formers, and these are our ready box uh, permanent recess formers. They're manufactured from recycled HDPE, so they're environmentally friendly. They can be recycled uh, again. Um, they're cast into the core wall uh, by the frame contractor. Okay. They offer plus or minus 35 millimeters in tolerance, so plenty of site tolerance to make sure everything lines up. But there does need to be coordination between the frame contractor and the precaster to make sure the TSSs line up with the ready boxes when, when the landing arrives. So here's our landing. It's got our TSS cast in, and that's actually an acoustic version of the TSS. It's got sort of neoprene gaskets around it to minimise noise transfer to adjacent rooms. It's operated by cord, so we have a cord to pull it out and a cord to pull it in. Props are erected to the right height. Some contractors put shims in the bottom of the ready boxes to the right height, so the telescopic connector sits directly on the shims. The landing is lowered into position. Everything should line up nicely because there's been that coordination between the frame contractor and the precaster. There's our ready box in the core wall. And now we split to uh, animation on the left hand side and footage on the right hand side. So typically backing rod is pushed down the gap between the landing and the wall to seal the gap around the connector. The connector is pulled out. A bolt is placed in position to prevent it from retracting. And then the pocket is simply grouted up by one person using a pourable grout harnessed on at the top of the landing. It's as simple and as quick as that. You know, it's a very simple, very quick and very safe operation. Now, sometimes we have structural engineers say to us, well, we don't get involved in the design of the support of the landings. You know, that's all part of the frame contractor's responsibility. Um, but hopefully it will become evident during the presentation that the advantages gained from using telescopic connectors um, give the structural engineer the opportunity to really add value to the project. So I'm now going to pass you over to my colleague Steve, who will look at designing landing supports for structural performance, including providing for anchorage fire resistance and also go into the risks of site not accu accurately implementing the structural engineer's design. So thank you, Sally. Now, stair landings have their own unique features, which can also be relevant when designing any precast concrete floor. This stair landing is to be supported off the surrounding walls and will support separate precast stair flights along its front edge. The typical forces to be considered are from the dead weight of the landing, including any screeds and finishes, the dead weight of the flights, and again, including the finishes and any balustrades, the live loads representing the usage of the stairs, and for projects in the British Isles, the horizontal forces defined in PD 6687 part one. The trend for larger floors to ceiling heights has meant that the length of flights are getting longer. The requirement for taller building and hence higher occupancy levels has meant that stair widths have also increased to cope. These both contribute to larger concentrated forces along the front edge of the landing. One method of supporting a landing is to use a rolled steel angle where the vertical legs are fixed to the wall and the horizontal legs support the landing. As previously mentioned, the highest forces are along the front edge of the landing. The largest forces and therefore stresses will be at the end of the angle. When selecting and designing the supporting angle, things to consider are high stresses at the end of the angle. So make sure the cut end is smooth to eliminate stress raises. 
bending in the legs and also crushing in the concrete local to the corner of the angle. If the selected angle does not have sufficient strength and stiffness, the angle can also be overstressed and possibly start deflecting. Telescopic connectors, however, can be positioned to transmit the loads more effectively and efficiently into adjacent walls. Vertical forces are transmitted within the walls and not eccentrically, like in an angle, meaning the supporting walls can be made thinner or even from twin wall. The rolled hollow uh, section of the inner is far stronger and has a stiffer shape compared to the leg of an angle and so can resist greater bending forces. The steel in the connector is acting more, far more efficiently compared to an angle, which is, has a constant cross section along its length. In fact, the weight of two connectors is about half the weight of an alternative angle. The picture shows an angle installed not aligned with the landing, and so it is difficult to determine where the actual forces are being affected. Now, for those of you who have designed connections using fixings, these use, um, you probably used manufacturer's bespoke software to help simplify and quicken the process and help eliminate errors. When several holes are subjected to shear load, SOFA and ENSA, so design methods, need to be selected within the software in order to produce a result. When these design methods are selected, the software shows filled holes and filling washers on each fixing. These filling washers have side holes, as you can see on the diagrams on the right, which allows the resin to be injected through them and into the annular gap around the fixings within the hole. This is to ensure that the shear forces are distributed across all fixings. It all seems very easy, simple and obvious when working at your computer and the output gives clear calculations. But have you ever considered how this information is transferred to site, especially how it is communicated to the person carrying out the installation? And do they know what to do and why they are doing it? Now, the software is based on EN 1992 part four, which is the standard which designs the method for calculating fixings used in concrete. It states multiple fixings resisting a shear load should have no clearance hole or tight hole tolerances as shown in the table. Effectively, two millimeters bigger than the diameter of the fixing. Or the fixings can be welded to the fixture or be mortared in to ensure that the shear force is distributed across the fixings. Now, bearing in mind uh, that it's almost impossible to drill several holes into concrete with an accuracy of plus or minus one millimeter, and to facilitate work on site, most angles are pre-machined with holes which are oversized and are sometimes slotted. This is done so that masonry drill bits pass through the holes when the angles are held in position against the wall. Now, if resin fixings are being used, the drill bit diameter size required is two to four millimeters larger than the fixing hole, requiring a much larger hole in the angle. So as the moment on the fixings, any slotted holes should be filled or other measures taken to ensure that when the shear load is applied, it is distributed across all the fixings. I have worked with concrete fixings a lot in my previous roles, especially as a Hilti engineer and designing and installing structural steelwork. From designing the connection to installing and testing them on site. Using post install fixings are for many applications the best option, so I'm not anti fixings, but they do have their risks, especially when there are so many to be installed. 
So installing fixings into reinforcement into reinforced concrete is hard work. It is physically difficult and demanding, especially when you're working off a platform at an uncomfortable drilling height or position. It is noisy and can be dusty, especially if extra dust extraction is not used. Rushing to get the job finished can put the quality of the installation at risk. On the photograph in the right is from an actual site. It is taken from above the landing, looking down the gap at the vertical leg on the angle where the fixings are going through it into the wall. If you look closer, i.e. the photos below it, there is no evidence that the annular gap is filled or any action to distribute the shear forces evenly has been put in. The heads of the fixings are not flush with the face of the angle. This can be due to poor drilling angle or the drill bit hitting reinforcement in the wall and being deflected. The tensile forces therefore acting on the angled bolt heads can be deflected or the shanks may bend on the fixings which can cause weakening and even failure. Drilling the wall reinforcement in several places weakens the wall and affects the continuity of the wall reinforcement. Other risks, I am sure you are aware, are inadequate hole drilling depth, using the wrong type of resin, or not cleaning the hole out correctly. All these can contribute to a genuine risk of structural of weakened structural performance due to poor workmanship. But I will come back to that in a minute. The location of the forces around the angle, especially dimension C relative to B, and the size of the clearance gap shown here at A, is critical as the lever effect can considerably multiply the forces acting on the fixings. The number and spacings of the fixings is important as if the fixings are too close together, their capacity is reduced. And if they are too far apart, the angle may start bending and not distribute the forces evenly. It is worth noting that the flights have usually been installed for many weeks before the air gap is grouted around the landing. This is a period of high risk as the angles are not being supported and the fixings are in tension as mentioned in the previous slide, as well as shear. Before the, the grout is inserted, if the fixings have started to creep, or the shanks have bent or lengthened, or even snapped off, the angle can move. Grouting the gap will mean that the fixings will have an offset and are in bending as well as shear, dramatically reducing the capacity of the fixings. Now, if anybody does specify fixings regularly and would like to know more about how fixings can be installed safely, an organization called the Construction Fixings Association offer excellent training and information to specifiers, distributors and installers. So I would recommend you visit their website for more information and looking at the code of practice BS8539. We have also published this issue in a cross report, which can be downloaded from this seminar or obtained from our website or the iStruct T. Now, CROSS is a secure and confidential safety reporting system, which has been set up by the iStruct T, the ICE and the HSE to allow professionals to share their experiences in order to help others. CROSS is designed to help professionals to make structures safer by publishing safety information based on submitted reports and information in the public domain. One of the comments back from our cross report was that fixings make up the largest category of concerns reported to cross. We also wrote a publication in Concrete magazine about the issues 
about these issues, which can also be downloaded. So, if these issues keep occurring, is it actually poor workmanship, or could it be poor communication in defining clearly what is required, or is it an inappropriate process? To require the installers to do a physically demanding and skilled process in a difficult circumstance so many times. So why take the risk of using fixings in this application? Now, here we have two relevant articles. The article on the left is from the Irish Con Construction News written because of the concerns raised by precast concrete suppliers who have had doubts about the design and installation of fixings due to the incidents that have occurred in the recent past. The second article is about an incident where fixings holding an angle failed, causing the landing to drop by 12 to 15 millimetres, similar to the example shown in the earlier slide. Unfortunately, the fixings continued to fail and the landing became attached, detached even, causing the stairs to collapse and tragically killing a construction worker. So the consequences of failure can be severe. When the national design standards for concrete buildings were harmonised into the Euro codes, there were a few UK practices not included, but they were still deemed important to follow and PD 6687 part one is one such document written for concrete buildings to collect some of them. Now, although Euro code two has requirements for robustness and tying, it does not cover the anchorage of precast elements such as floors, roofs and stair members. So the requirement for precast units is for them to be anchored back to the structure which contains ties and that the strength of this anchorage is capable of carrying the dead weight of the members. Now this requirement is regarded as a robustness requirement. It is not really to do with robustness as it uses the terms anchorage as, instead of tying and it is also relevant to the connection between the flight and the landing. For landing supported by rolled steel angles, some sort of physical interlock needs to be included to restrain the landing in both horizontal planes. The sketch detail in the middle of the slide shows a detail we were sent showing how the engineer envisaged the landing to be supported and restrained. The landing is being supported by an angle where a shear stud is welded to the horizontal leg which fits into a pocket in the landing. To resist horizontal forces, continuity strip into the wall is straightened out and tied to rebar stirrups fixed to the landing and the hidden and, and is hidden in a thick structural topping. How this would actually work in reality is unknown as the reinforcement would clash with the rear hoops. This sketch uses a lot of labor and is labor intensive. So typically a shear stud in a pocket is used to connect the landing to the angle as shown in the drawings on the right. Where the fixings and the angle would actually restrain, would well, whether they would actually restrain the uh, landing in the horizontal forces is still suspect. So using our telescopic connectors located on all three sides of the landing means that the landing is anchored in all three direct, in all directions. This arrangement uses our standard connectors and standard ready box recess formers. This is a common arrangement and for the landing to move in the horizontal direction, the telescopic inner part of the connector has to be sheared through. So, 
So if there was anything to happen with the side walls or the uh, flight, then the uh, landing would be restrained by the two side connectors of which one is circled. If the landing uh, is affected or a wall is affected at one end, horizontal movement is restrained from the two rear connectors. However, if there is no real rear wall or there are large openings for glazings, this arrangement requires our pin version of the connector and ready box. The pin version is slightly taller and once grouted up, this arrangement has an actual capacity of 30 kilonewtons and the two connections would have a, connections would have a horizontal capacity of 60 kilonewtons. So, where there is um, anything to affect the uh, landing or the end wall, the pinned arrangement for the connector into the wall will restrict any, will restrict any horizontal movement. Supporting beams of continuous columns can utilise connectors in a similar, similar way, which can replace the use of traditional core balls. When compared against using BSF connectors, core balls are complicated to design and often require a bespoke detail, difficult to incorporate into round columns or to support off other beams, and require thick, thicker, taller columns. The column design is significantly different depending on the number of cult beams being supported off it. As I've mentioned before, core balls are complicated to design and so most are designed using specialist software. The geometry, size and location of the reinforcement is critical and can be different from one column to the next as it is dependent upon the forces from the beams acting on the column. To simplify production and have consistency, the column with the worst case loading is usually designed and used in all positions. We have technical memos containing specific connectors and local reinforcement details which can be easily incorporated and applied to any column size and reinforcement. This greatly simplifies the detailing processes, reduces the risk of errors and means the columns are more efficient at carrying their specific forces. 3D and 2D connector models are available from our website for easy inclusion into drawings, etc. The connectors are easy to specify by their capacity and the extra local reinforcement is typical to the reinforcement already detailed in the beam and column. Our BSF connectors are configured from three parts. The, be the beam unit is cast into the supported beam to provide the pocket for the sliding knife to fit fully into and provides an opening for the knife to move into. It also has special steel sections which can transfer the forces to the local reinforcement. The sliding knife is a steel plate which slides out of the beam unit into the column unit or beam unit. Beam to beam unit, sorry. The column or beam to beam unit form the pockets for the sliding knife to fit into and transfer the forces into supporting columns or beams. Not only can the connectors be used to support beams off rectangular or square columns, but they can also be used to support beams from circular columns and other beams both of which would be extremely difficult to design, calculate and manufacture using core balls.
Columns with corbels have to accommodate large eccentric forces being applied from the connecting beams. FEA models of a column in bending shows high tensile stresses here in red in the column on the opposite side of the corbel. High compressive forces or stresses shown in blue are in the column below the corbel. Using a BSF connector allows the vertical load to be transferred a lot closer to the center line of the column. The bending and therefore the tensile and compressive stresses are therefore considerably lower as shown in the orange and yellow colouring. Where the high compressive stress can be seen below the column unit, this is accommodated by the column unit structure and is therefore not an issue. This highlights that a slimmer and lighter column can be used containing less concrete, as there are, is a far smaller eccentric load being applied. To achieve large open plan buildings, strong, longer spans between columns are required. Column spacing supporting slab floor slab type floors are limited where there are high floor loadings to the capacity of the punching shear solution installed in the floor. Incorporating slab and beam floors can reduce the amount of concrete being used and allow off-site precast elements. Supporting the floor beams off columns and corbels increases the total thickness as corbels are typically hidden within fault ceilings. Incorporating telescopic connectors to join beams to columns and beams to beams removes this issue, meaning either a shorter, lighter building or extra floor space as extra floors can be included. Telescopic connectors offer a defined and justified structural performance for con connecting precast concrete elements. We are able to offer ETA and or CE marking to EN1090. We are also working on obtaining UKCA and UKNI. Our bespoke calculations for landing connections give assurance of the forces being transferred through the connectors into the walls, temporary forces during construction, and compliance with the requirements for anchorage to PD 6687 part one. With regards to the BSF and column connectors, standard details including local reinforcement are available for the particular vertical forces required. For help in specifying connectors, please visit our website or contact us. And with this and little more information, we can specify the type and location of connectors to use for inclusion straight into your drawings and specifications. We work with most of the concrete frame contractors and precasters, so we can offer support from design through manufacture to installation. To meet fire requirements, angles require fire protection from either intermescent paint or lightweight steel channels and fireboard. Intermescent paints require careful material selection and thickness to achieve the required fire resistance, careful application by an approved person, Controlled application conditions to avoid UV, UV exposure and humidity and protection from being chipped, making them expensive to apply. Fire protection from a lightweight channel and fireboard system needs to be correctly designed and installed and specified. It requires expensive materials and skilled labour to install.
Telescopic connectors are embedded in the landing and once grouted in, typically flush with the top and bottom of the landing, the inner has a, around 75 millimetres of concrete or grout cover. Fire resistance is proportional to cover. So if 40 millimetres of grout gives 120 minutes of fire resistance, so connectors with almost double the cover will be well protected. The BSF connectors have a similar amount of cover. It's a simple solution requiring no extra detailing, no additional materials and no additional skilled work. The benefit of only having to grout in connectors to provide fire resistance becomes more apparent when the landing is an irregular shape. Not only would the landing be supported off an expensive curved angle, but protecting it with a channel and fireboard system would be even more complicated and wasteful of the fireboard. And on that topic, let me hand you back to Sally, who will discuss more environmental advantages of using telescopic connectors. Thanks ever so much, Steve. Um, well, so now we're going to talk about the environmental impact. Now, reduce, reuse, and recycle are the three R's when it comes to minimising material. Uh, when it comes to minimising environmental impact. Um, with the best option being to reduce material usage in the first place. So on the left here, I've got two photographs showing typical corbel details, um, and they clearly require additional concrete to form the corbel. But as previously mentioned by Steve, the architect's almost certainly going to want to hide those corbels within the floor space, which means we're going to have a greater height slab to slab, requiring a, a longer column. So we've not only got increased concrete in the corbel, we've got more concrete in the column. And, and also, because of those eccentric and compressive, that, that, that compressive and tensile load, because of the eccentricity, we've got a thicker column. So we're using more concrete in the column. Now, concrete's a fantastic product. It's a fantastic material with, with many, many benefits. But cement production is one of the biggest contributors to CO2 emissions in the world. Um, I think it's second only to transportation. So if we can reduce the amount of concrete that we use on a project while maintaining uh, structural performance, then that's a massive plus. So on the right hand picture here, we've got Glanbier ingredients in the Republic of Ireland, where you can see there's four beams going into the head of the column. Uh, and that's using our, our BSF connectors. So there's no corbels on that column. And in fact, adjacent either side of the uh, column, we've got beam to beam connections again with no corbels. So we've reduced the amount of concrete. Um, and also, if, the, if, if we haven't got that eccentric load, we've got a simpler design for the column, possibly less reinforcement. Um, another benefit is that, personally, for me, I think that's quite a nice architectural detail. You know, it may well be that the architect doesn't feel they need any additional ceiling finishes. They might want to make a feature of the structure and of the construction method. Um, and therefore, no additional finishes are going to be required at the, uh, to the ceiling. So not only have we reduced the amount of concrete, and possibly the amount of reinforcement, we've also just increased the, the amount of materials in the finishes. And therefore, um, we've also required fewer deliveries to site. So with all of that reduction in material usage, we've got a smaller carbon footprint for the building. Another area where um, we can make more efficient use of materials is in the creation of the moulds. If we look at the photograph on the left hand side, this is a timber mould, but quite often they're steel. Um, and as you can see, we've got material cut to odd lengths to create those corbels. And each mould is going to be unique to the column and the corbel configuration that it's um, being used for. So if you look at the detail be below with the multicolored columns, uh, we've got four different types of moulds there because we've got four different types of columns and they're going to be unique to those columns um, and they can't be used again. And now on the right hand side, we've got a column with connectors, a mould for connectors, nice long straight lengths of material which can be used again and again and again. Um, 
So you can use the same mold for all the different columns as long as they're the same dimensions. Um, all you need to do is move the connector positions. So we've got reusable molds, smaller molds, fewer of them, they're simpler to manufacture and we've made a, a much more efficient use of the, the materials, the steel or the timber being used to manufacture the molds. So when it comes to value engineering and to reducing costs and accelerating program, sometimes people uh, sort of think that because the technology is relatively new, it's a new idea, um, it's going to be prohibitively expensive. Um, but we've done a, a peer-reviewed costing analysis comparing installing landings, in this case using roll steel angles, with installing landings using telescopic connectors. Um, and taking into account the amount of time used um, and the cost of materials, we found a 33% saving in labour and materials. And actually, this was done a couple of years ago, and as Steve mentioned, two connectors is less than half the weight of steel of an angle. And if you've been watching the uh, construction news um, lately, steel prices have absolutely rocketed. So that saving is going to be even greater now. Okay? But as well as the uh, material costs of, of um, the connectors, also, because they're completely hidden, as we've shown, um, it's highly likely that the architect isn't going to require any finishes. In fact, they're not going to require any finishes. On the left-hand side here, it's in Co House. I took this photograph last summer. The architect has opted for fair-faced concrete finish throughout, again, because they want to sort of make a feature of the construction of the building. Uh, we've also got exposed services. And as you can see, that stair core, no visible means of support. So there's no additional finishes in the stair core on that building. To the right, East Village, uh, this is a project in Stratford, part of the Olympic Park sort of legacy uh, buildings that are going up. This is a MACE Tech project. Um, and if you're not familiar with MACE Tech, they're a new division of MACE, specifically designed for modular build. Uh, so the floors are coming in with all the um, services attached, the walls are coming in with all the, uh, all the external walls are coming in with all the cladding and the windows attached. And for speed of construction, MACE Tech are using RVKs to connect integral stairs and landings to the core wall. Okay, so they've been able to maintain this modular build method of fast installation. Uh, but also, again, this photograph I took last summer, there's no additional finishes. They painted one wall, rather bright, sort of red, orangey colour, but there's not going to be any plasterboard, there's not going to be any plastering, no dry lining, anything like that. Just uh, a nice, neat concrete finish with no visible means of support. Um, so again, this provides a significant cost saving to the client. You know, they're not paying for the materials again, so we've made that environmental advantage, um, and also they're not providing for the skilled labour. And again, talking about speed of construction, angles are really slow to install. As Steve has said, we're drilling a lot of holes. Uh, we're manoeuvring the angle down the down the core using a crane, and that's a crane operation, manoeuvring it into position and holding it in place while we drill our holes, repeating the process at the other end, installing the landing and then and the stairs, and then repeating the whole process again. So we can only do one floor at a time, working our way up the building. Photograph in the middle, Kidbrook Village, big Barclay Group project in Greenwich. You can see there four levels of ready boxes waiting for the landings and the stairs to arrive. So they can go in really quickly, one after another, easily several floors in one day. Uh, we supplied to the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium um, and they, in one shift, in one shift, they installed 12 flights of stairs. So the stairs and landings can go in really quickly. Um, and that's why um, CJ O'Shea specifically opted for the products on Orchard Wharf. Uh, we've got an integral stair and landing here. Here they grouted the entire joint. So you can see ply formwork around the joint between the landing and the core because they grouted the entire joint, not just the uh, not just where the, the connectors are. Um, but CJ O'Shea's site manager just said to me they've specifically gone for connectors because they install the landing, they can use the stairs immediately after they've been installed. They don't need to provide um, any external stairs anywhere else. They can install the landings really quickly and the stairs really quickly and use them straight away. 
have immediate access to the working area. And again, there's going to be no additional finishes in that core. So there's no following trains clogging up the core either. And I gave a presentation last year to Eric Parry um, Architects, and one of their associates said afterwards, the fact that there's no, no additional finishes required can really speed up a big project. You know, we're supplying to uh, South Key Plaza, it's over 60 stories high. You know, so if there's no additional finishes in the core, that's a huge saving, both in cost and in time. Now, when it comes to our CDM obligations, um, this is a piece of legislation specific to the UK. Um, and it uh, states that um, it's the construction design and management regulations. And it specifically states that the designer's main duty is to eliminate, reduce or control foreseeable risks okay, that may arise during construction. Um, and like our reduce, reuse, recycle, eliminate, reduce or control is in that order for a reason. So we can reduce or control by method statements and PPE. But ideally, we want to eliminate risk. Um, before we even get to site, we can design it out of the process. And fixing angles has a, a, a significant number of uh, health and safety risks, mainly because it involves drilling. Okay, so we've got um, exposure to dust, uh, we've got excessive noise, vibration, um, the risk of kickback, which is where the drill is rotating, the drill bit's rotating, the drill bit snatches on the rebar, like Steve mentioned stops rotating and then the drill itself rotates and it wrenches the hand of the person holding it because it will happen instantaneously. As Steve also mentioned, it's hard physical work this, so people will get tired. So um, they've got all their PPE on, um, they're, if they're like me, their glasses are steaming up. Um, it's noisy, it's unpleasant, it's an unpleasant working environment. They're working at height for a prolonged period of time while they're getting tired, so they've got the risk, increased risk of falling. This angle is being lowered down the course, so they've got the risk of being hit by the angle. They've got all their tools, their power supply, vacuuming equipment if they're using that, so they've got trip hazards. Um, and the Mineral Products Association recognises that exposure to dust, falling from height and risk of being struck are three of the six most common ways in which people are killed or seriously injured on UK construction sites. So installing angles is a very hazardous operation. However, by using telescopic connectors, we've eliminated drilling completely from the process. There's no noise, there's no kickback, there's no vibration. We've greatly reduced the exposure to dust because the only dust is very briefly at the initiation of mixing the grout, and that can be done outside in um, a well-ventilated area. You're wearing less PPE, so it's more comfortable and it's not noisy or dusty. Um, the connectors are cast in to the landing, so you're not maneuvering heavy angles about, so we've not got heavy manual handling on site. There's less crane operations because you're not maneuvering the, the uh, angle down the core, so there's less risk of being struck. And you're operating the connectors from the top of the landing but you're harnessed on and you're up there for moments. So you've got minimal time being spent at height. So we've reduced that potential for falling and you're not using any tools apart from your watering can. So we've got no trip hazards. So we've eliminated most of the risk by designing it out of the process up front. So in conclusion, When it comes to structural performance, um, telescopic connectors provide a far more efficient design with the connectors optimally positioned to resist the forces. Um, we can provide anchorage by either positioning uh, the units or by using the pinned connection. So it's a very simple, straightforward method for providing anchorage. We have that inherent fire protection uh, provided by the grout. And you've got that technical assurance of, of technical support from ourselves and our CE marking and our uh, ETA, et cetera. From an environmental point of view, uh, we've minimized material usage. We've minimized the amount of concrete. Uh, we've minimized any additional finishes and we've got fewer deliveries to site. 
from a delivering cost and program efficiencies, we've got rapid installation of the stairs. As I said, rapid installation of the stairs, which means fast access up and down, but we haven't got the cost of providing temporary stairs elsewhere. Fewer site operations, um, because we're not installing all those finishes and we're not using the crane as much. And we've reduced those direct and indirect costs, particularly when it comes to installing landings. And then with regarding our C CDM regulations, We've designed out most of the risk with regards to health and safety, you know, um, and that has therefore uh, further simplified the uh, the site management. So what we've hopefully illustrated is that our connectors uh, make it extremely easy, simple, and straightforward to meet all of these challenges simultaneously. Um, now I mentioned after the video uh, that that. Um, Sometimes structural engineers don't want to get involved in the design of the stairs. Um, and therefore, the decisions are often contractor led. And there are several major frame contractors that use connectors. You know, we have several major, major con um, contractors where for whom it's their, their um, preferred method of construction now. But there are also lots of other contractors out there that don't know the, the products exist. So we're hoping um, that structural engineers uh, will begin to assert themselves. Um, over the contractors with regards to the selection of the connection method. Okay. So with that, that just about ends the presentation. Um, I'll just show this example. This is 20 Farringdon Street. You've seen this uh, a few times in terms of you've seen a chap on top of a landing. Uh, this is the end product. This is the sort of thing that can be achieved using precast concrete and telescopic connectors. Okay. We've got a fantastic stair core here. Um, but it wasn't purely for aesthetic reasons that the contractors and the architect and the engineer chose telescopic connectors. It was also for speed of construction. Okay. We'll just see now if we've got any questions. Okay, so uh, one of the questions we've got is about um, method of construction. Uh, I think Steve mentioned twin wall at one point. Um, can the can the connectors be used in uh, jump form or slip form? So, I actually visited a project in Manchester uh, February before last, uh, before the pandemic. We'd even heard of the pandemic actually. And um, funny enough, talking about architect engineers asserting themselves, the contractor wanted to use angles because it's what they were used to. Um, they'd never heard of telescopic connectors, and they were a bit sceptical, and so they they went for. Um, they wanted to use angles, but the engineer, Ramble, as it was in Manchester, as it happens, um, insisted that they use telescopic connectors, and so they did. And they were, they were delighted. The architect told me they were delighted. And then I spoke to the contractor, which was Marshalls, and they said the same. They were delighted. They were so easy to use. But the cores on that project were slip form. And uh, and the, connect, the, the ready boxes are designed to be tied to the reinforcement. They can either be nailed to form or tied to the reinforcement. So as long as they're suitably tied, as, as they're designed to be, they will stay in place as the shuttering moves past. So they've been successfully used in slip form, uh, jump form, traditional, precast, twin wall. You know, the method of construction of the core uh, is, is makes no difference whatsoever to the successful use of the products. So I've had another question about, can you talk about the construction tolerances of the product? So um, the construction tolerances are mainly uh, taken care of in the ready boxes. Yeah. Um, where you've got sort of plus or minus 30 millimetres in all um, sort of directions, so vertically and horizontally. So uh, that one uh, hopefully answers your question on that. Um, so if specified, what typical processes of working with precast company? Um, just I'll just answer that question. So it's, it's if specified, what's the typical process for working with the PC company as the precast is often a manufacturer designed, is there any complication, any can't read, any complications specifying coordinating a third party product? Um, as I mentioned, there does need to be coordination between the frame contractor and the precaster. And so the precaster needs to be appointed early to make sure um, that the product is installed in the correct place so that the frame contractor installs the ready box in in in, in the right place so they the, the frame contractor needs to know early from the precaster where that ready box needs to be with regards to specifying the product the precaster just needs to send us the loads and the dimensions of the landings we work out 
the load, the, the reactions, and will tell you exactly where the connectors need to be. Um, if it happens that, for example, and this has, has happened in the past where the core has been being constructed before the landing, the precast has been appointed, it is possible to core out pockets in the core post sort of post drill large pockets and use those instead of the ready boxes um, and then grout those up as normal but it it doesn't make the best use of the products because really we want to get away from drilling at all but uh, the products are very simple to specify um, it's just a question of telling us the, the loads and, and we'll tell you exactly what units you need and where they need to go yeah the, en the engineer doesn't really need to get in you know all the engineer needs to do is put telescopic connector on their drawing because the design is done by the precast and ourselves and we've, we've had actually had um examples where the frame contractor has been that desperate to use our products <laughs> uh but has unfortunately had to start construction of the walls mm -hmm. and so therefore the precast hasn't been designed and the actual specific locations of the uh, ready boxes haven't been defined yet and so what they've done is is you know shot the walls up to a certain stage then are going back to core drill the walls and mm. we've got solutions for the standard um connectors and also the pinned connectors mm. so you know no matter sort of when you want to start using this you know we, we've, we've got solutions to help you out so if you've not put them in or you put them in the wrong place you know we've got all bases covered mm -hmm. so question here do you grout with cementitious mortar yes basically that's a nice nice easy question good yeah. uh what's the minimum landing thickness to accommodate your product excellent question so um the yeah, only architects need to know this actually yeah. <laughs> so typically uh for the rbk 101 and the tss 101 ranges that's 200 millimeters so as long as the landing is thicker than 200 millimeters uh, our connectors can fit in and that's more to do with fitting reinforcement around it mm -hmm. and, and acquiring the load. So, a okay. uh, couple of other questions. Well, what about inspection, repair, or replacement during service life? Um, well, our, our European Technical Assessment gives a fifty-year um, minimum minimum life. Yes, yeah, so I think in, in, on this one, uh, because it's a warm, dry environment, and because they're fully grouted in unlike connectors which are sort of yeah. left exposed okay. and yeah. so forth and, and exposed during the uh, construction phase um the life expectancy is is well over 50 years yeah but the tss range of connectors are also galvanized so um they're protected for longer and can be sort of stored outside in um, harsher environments before they're actually used also so Okay, in which direction do the connectors slide out into the column wall or into the beam landing? So they they go from the landing into the wall or from the beam into the column. So the, the internal bit is in the in the landing and extends out into the into the core wall, or the knife in the BSF extends out into the column. So we've got a question here about torsion um possibly to do more with the the bsf connectors now the bsf connectors can take a little torsion but usually what we find is the horizontal tying required around uh, bsf connectors can also compensate for the torsion as well so um, again it's the bsf connectors taking the vertical load and then supplementary steel work around the beams and columns which take the torsion and the tying forces. Uh, do we also have connectors that are able to connect precast concrete wall elements between each other? Yes, we do. Uh, and it's, it's funny you should say that because we were discussing whether to actually include this. We also have a range of products called DTS mm -hmm. And they are uh, specific, it's, it's like an RVK and a TSS effectively on its side. Mm. So it can transmit sort of vertical loads more in thinner vertical sections as opposed to flat horizontal mm. sections. So yes, if you're interested in uh, knowing about more about that, please get in touch with you, us and uh, we can send you uh, more information. And I also think actually they have been used on the cheese grater. Greater, yes for the core wall, for walls in the cheese grater they were used. So how do you ensure that the connector is fully grouted? So the RBK connector 
is actually hollow inside and has the hopper which is hollow as well mm. so you can pour the grout in at the um in the air gap yeah and you can actually see it rise up in the uh, recess former yeah and you can also see it rise up uh, mm -hmm. through the connector as well so um you know seeing is believing i suppose so uh, so yes you can see totally what's going on uh, regards filling is there any limitation on span of element can it be for beam span around 15 meters i would think the limiting factor for that is actually the design of the beam yes and also the loadings at the mm. ends of the beams so if you've got a particular application in mind um, sort of please get in touch with us and mm. um, we can sort of send you more details yes i mean the bsf does go up to 1100 kilonewtons in capacity well you, you can actually use the products in pairs as well so okay. uh, so mm. that can uh, increase capacity okay. as well so uh, so we've got one given the tolerance on the ready box it, in installation how is the telescopic part of the connector supported prior to grouting is shimming necessary at each ready box now we've sort of seen in practice two types of installation method one is is where the landing is lowered onto props yeah. uh, at the right level and then when the um, connectors are extended and grouted no shimming is required because mm. the the connectors are effectively at the right height and so forth mm. but for speed of construction most uh, frame contractors i think do opt for shimming below um below the connector and uh, they just use steel shims mm -hmm. um pre-installed because they obviously they know exactly what the height of the, mm -hmm. the landing needs to be so they know exactly what the um um the shimming thickness uh, can be so right do you have specially trained personnel to facilitate site construction well mm -hmm. we have sally who uh, <laughs> is uh, is desperate <laughs> once lockdown is eased and everything to actually go out and uh, give toolbox talks yeah. demonstrations yeah. you know support you all all she can on um you know how these things are installed how yeah. the ready box is installed basically how to get the best practice out of it you know even down to sort of throwing ropes around the landing mm -hmm. so that the landings don't scuff on the walls yeah. uh, and so forth so uh, so yes any um any invitations for sally i'm sure she'll uh, be pleased okay uh, does the long-term performance of the product rely on the ready boxes having been grouted up in addition to grout filling of the gap between the landing and the wall if so how is this grouting verified well that's that's a good question the the grouting is actually required more for fire performance as, mm. as we've discussed mm. um and then fully grouting uh, also gives environmental protection you know it stops protects it from you know if things are spilled on it and so forth so um i think most concrete frame con contractors are pretty proficient in grouting mm -hmm. uh, you know they know when it's sort of solid because it's a um, sort of pourable mix it, it sort of fills and, and searches mm -hmm. out any nooks and, and, and crevices and, yeah. and so forth so uh, so yeah so we, we would certainly recommend grouting around the um, connectors so um, it, it also actually as, as well as Steve mentioned um, the highest loading is at the front of the landing where there's um uh the stairs are being fit, are, are connected so again grouting fully grouting the ready box just prevents any risk of uplift that there may be at the back so it is best practice to grout the boxes as well uh, and then in terms of you know again i'd love to come to site i'm more than happy to come to site just to look at what you're doing um just to check that uh yeah that uh that you know you're happy with uh site are happy with with how they're doing things so uh, and on that note and looking at the time obviously we've overrun yeah. considerably yeah so, we were uh, late starting yeah but so uh but uh anyway so yep yeah, i'll just i'll just wrap up then so um i'd like to thank the iStruck team particularly for giving us the opportunity to present our contact details can be seen on the slide um we're on Twitter, we're on LinkedIn, we're on YouTube, their email address is there, our phone number. Just to reiterate, we're based in the UK. Uh, we work on UK and Republic of Ireland based projects. 
So if you're coming from outside of the UK, if you're working on projects outside of the British Isles, um, please, uh, and you've got questions or you, you need a technical support, please contact our colleagues in Norway and, and their details are on that slide as well. So with that, um, I'd like to thank you ever so much um, and please uh, enjoy the rest of the day.